Well, we've come to it. The big kahuna. This is our microprocessor without control circuitry. And this is really everything that this class has been building up to. And it's kind of a nice handoff point to your CSC 230 class, which comes next in this sequence. So it's all about register transfer to perform a desired operation. So let's go ahead and look at the various regions that we have in the circuit first, and then we'll see uh, an example in action. So down below is the memory. Okay. And we've got three types of memory. We've got ROM, which is short for read-only memory. And so when you look at these, you will notice that data is coming in from an outside source. So the outside source may be a flash drive, or it may be a keyboard that's connected to your, uh, to your microprocessor. So this is read-only because we're accepting that information from the outside source, but we're not able to write any new information to this memory with our current circuit. Contrast that with the WOM or write-only memory. And so here, we've got the data bus. We'll explain that more in a second. We are sending information from our large circuit into a register. So we are storing this information for later use. We are writing to this register. And that's all we can do. We actually can't read this information back into our circuit. And then down below, we're combining both of these functions with RAM memory. So RAM is short for random access memory. I don't really like that name because it's not random. What it really means is that we have read or write access to this data. Okay. So the information will be stored in this register here. And if I want to, if I choose RAM number six, then I can read that same information back out to this data bus. But I can also pass information into this register from the data bus, from the larger circuit. So I can both read into this memory, I'm sorry, I can both write into this memory, and I can read out of this memory. I can do both of those. Okay. How can we choose which memory device we're accessing at one time? That's done with this device address over here. So if I want to choose, say, ROM number one, I select device number one here, and then this line gets enabled, okay? which means ROM number one now has the ability to have its information read. How can I choose which mode I'm in, either read, write, or neither? That's done with these switches here. So if I want to read, I can flip on that switch, but I shouldn't be reading and writing at the same time. So I should always have one of these active and one of these inactive, or I could have the case where both of them are inactive. The heart of this circuit, and you see these devices throughout, is registers. Right? We've got registers here, here. Uh, these aren't exactly registers, but they are outside information. We've got registers down there and there. So this is all about storing and transferring data. It's all about register transfer. What are registers made up of? Well, if we double click inside, we see we've got flip-flops. Okay. So flip-flops are inside these registers. When are flip-flops allowed to change state? when the clock changes. So nothing's going to be happening as long as I'm not flipping this clock switch. But when I do flip the clock switch, then things are allowed to change. Okay, and then over here, I've got the actual processor. Okay. The ALU, my arithmetic logic unit, is able to perform a variety of arithmetic 
or logic operations depending on which function I select. And it will perform this function on the two 4-bit inputs that are passed in. So I can store my B values on this register. I can pass in new A values on this line. And now I've got 4 bits for A, 4 bits for B. And then I perform whatever function I select based on here. And depending on that function, I'm going to get a 4-bit output here. This output gets stored temporarily in the accumulator until we allow it to be passed back out to the data bus. So those are the broad sections. And the one common thread connecting all of these sections is the data bus. So that's why I made this one big line. There's actually four wires in this bus, right? This is a nice purple color, so it stands out. And we can see how it intertwines with all of the different devices. It can accept memory here from that read-only memory and then send that down the line to be processed by my ALU. And then once it's processed, it can be passed out onto that same data bus. And then once it's passed out here, then it can be written, the data there can be written into either my RAM memory or my write-only memory. Yeah. So a lot of different devices have access to this one data bus. This can be dangerous, right? Any one wire can only hold one piece of information at any one time. So this tells me that only one device should have access to the data bus at any one time. So how can I control that? Well, it's with the read and write switches. It's with the accumulator output switch over here. And it's with the device address shown on the left side. Okay, so I'm going to run through an example, simple example. Let's do five plus two. Okay, five plus two. I know I can do that function because I've got the adding capability up here in my ALU. I want to store the 5 and the 2 in my ROMs. So I'm reading in this information from an outside source. Let's put the 5 on ROM 0 and the 2 on ROM 1. First thing that I need to do is read in that information for the 5. So what do I do? I come up to read mode and then I choose device 0. So now this line is enabled, and this line is enabled, which means that this 5 information is able to be passed out to the data bus. And we can verify that if we come over here. Oops. Data conflict. Why is there a data conflict? The accumulator is also outputting information. Right? I can't have two devices passing information information to the data bus at once, so I need to shut that off. So now only one device out of the dozen that we have here in the circuit, only one device currently has access to the data bus. So the 5 from ROM 0 is being selected, so that 5 information is being passed throughout this whole circuit. Most importantly for us, that 5 is coming up to this DMUX. So this DMUX is where we can either route this 5 directly to the ALU or we can route it into this temporary register B. And that's what we want to do in this case. So to pass it to B, I'm going to flip the switch here. And notice that the information for 5, 0, 1, 0, 1, is now at the front end of register B. But it's not on the back end yet. Why? because we need to clock that information into this register B. So I need to make sure that I've enabled the registers, that my clear function is off, right? It's active low, so I flip it high to make it inactive. And now to clock it in, 
I'm going to flip this clock switch low to high. And when I do that, notice that this 5 has now been clocked in to the output of register B. Great, so that 5 is going to sit there for a time while I do my other operations, which are I want to load in this 2 value onto the data bus. So how do I do that? I make sure I'm in read mode. And now I choose the memory address where that 2 is located. The 2 is at ROM 1, so I choose device number 1. And now a 2 is currently passed onto the data bus. So this 2 is being sent all over the place, but it doesn't really matter. It's being walled off because it's not being clocked into these registers yet. What I do care about is that there's a 2 on the front end of this DMUX. Right now it's being routed to register B, but it's not a problem and it hasn't overwritten the 5 that's currently stored there. What I want to do is flip this over to register A. I misspoke. It's not a register. It's just a direct input from the data bus through the DMUX into this ALU mini. And you notice that I've now got a 2 on this line and a 5 on the B lines. So 2 plus 5, that's the operation I want to do. Do I click F? No, that's going to do 5 minus 2 gives us 3. Do I want to shift A right by B? If I wanted that, I could click there. No, I want to do B plus A which is function 14 or function E. When I do that, notice my output here is a 7. 5 plus 2 gives me a 7. That's what I expect. This 7 is on the front end of this accumulator register. It's not on the output yet. Why? Because I haven't clocked it in yet. So let's come over here and clock it in. I need a positive edge to clock it in, so I flip that clock low to high. And now I notice I've got a 7 on the output of the accumulator. Okay. Now I want to pass this information through this buffer by flipping the switch high. It's going to be trouble if I flip it high right now. Why is that? Oh, shoot. The value on the data bus is now an X. There's a data conflict. I've got 7 being sent through this buffer, and I've still got the 2 being sent through this buffer. I can't have both values on there right now. So what do I do? I shut off the read mode. So now information is not being passed through this buffer. The only device with access to the data bus is this register which holds that value 7. We can see the 7 there, and we can also see that it's sitting on this data bus. Okay, I've done the computation. The last step is simply to store it. So this 7, I could loop that back up into my ALU. I could loop it down to one of these write-only memories. But let's come down to, say, RAM number 6. Okay. I've got a 7 sitting on the front end here but it hasn't been passed through the register yet. So what I need to do is turn into write mode and select device number six. So we come up here, we go into write mode, device number six, and now for the first time, this register is enabled, right? Notice a one value on this enable. What did I have to do to, to accomplish that? I need to be in write mode with a high value and choose device number six with a high value. So now I get that enabled. It's enabled, but the value hasn't been clocked in yet. So notice this is not a seven currently, but when I come up to clock it in, I now have a 7 sitting in memory. 
So to recap, what did I do? I preloaded values of 5 and 2 into these read-only memories. Individually, I selected each of these devices and read from them to pass that information into the ALU. The ALU did the operation for me. Then the output of that got sent to the data bus. And then that information got clocked into a region in memory. And to accomplish that, I needed to go into write mode, select the right device, and finally clock it in. This is a whole lot of steps just to do a simple operation, but it really gets down to the heart of how your computer is operating. In reality, there's not a human there sitting to click all of these buttons in the right sequence. This is what a microprocessor controller would be doing for you. So you as the human might type in code. That code would then be translated into a series of ones and zeros passed to the appropriate switches shown here, shown up here, to the function select, and so on. And all of this is happening in the span of a single clock pulse. Okay. This is why we need to have those clock pulses spaced out to have enough time for all the values to race around, get to where they need to be on the front end of these registers before that next clock pulse happens. When it does, the register values change and we start the whole process over again. Things need to change before that next clap happens.